Today we're speaking with Dr. Scott Lippman, Chair of the Department of Thoracic, Head and Neck Medical Oncology in the Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. He is also Editor-in-Chief of Cancer Prevention Research. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Would you briefly discuss the subject of your talk, Proximity of Personalized Risk and Predictive Markers to the Clinic? Well, um, this talk was really to, to focus on various markers of risk and of predicting um, efficacy of various agents and interventions that are very close to the clinic. And so I focused on um, molecular markers primarily that were either in clinical trial or were looked at within the context of a clinical trial. Um, there are a lot of these markers that are looked at from observational kinds of uh, settings and epidemiology, which are, are very important. But I wanted to sort of focus on ones that were, again, very close or in the clinic um, that hopefully in the next uh, couple years would actually uh, potentially um, be able to be used clinically. What is the potential for personalized prevention? Uh, I think it's very high. I think that um, the, I think it's uh, unreasonable to think that um, we can give um, uh, uh, people at various risk levels um, certain agents and expect uh, a home run that um, will prevent cancer, for instance, um, in, in, in all the patients or a large percentage of patients. I think we need to be able to personalize um, our, our interventions, both in terms of selecting individuals that um, are more likely to benefit from the intervention, but also individuals that are less likely to be harmed from the intervention. So, it's very similar to what's happening right now and over the past five years in cancer therapy. Um, we're moving away from treating all patients with a certain cancer in the same way, but looking at their tumors and seeing and, and their germline genetic uh, alterations and so on and predicting who should get what treatment, who's more likely to respond and not be harmed by, by a certain treatment. And in prevention, we're starting to move in that direction. So we're subsetting individuals with certain pre-malignancies or, or at risk of certain cancers into these risk groups and predictive groups that may benefit. And um, you know, I think this is, this is the future um, of the field. And uh, not only in, in interventions that, that we think of normally with drugs of chemopreventive interventions, but as we heard, even for things like smoking cessation, which is very difficult to do, but finding out based on molecular test who might benefit from one intervention or not to, to stop smoking. What are the challenges of personalized prevention? Well, there are many, um, and, um, and, and they're similar to personalized cancer therapy um, uh, in the same way that when you want a personalized treatment, um, from a practical point of view, um, you need to find out what markers you're looking at, again, whether it's in the blood or the pre-malignant cells or, or what have you. You need to do this real time. So. Um, what that means is that you have, if, if you're doing the context of a clinical trial or eventually if it becomes part of standard of care, someone will come in and you'll need to do tests, whatever they might be, that predict what, what treatment someone should get, what smoking cessation intervention, what drugs, and so on. And that has to be done real time. It can't be um, done the way we often do studies like that, molecular studies, where blood or tissue is collected and it's analyzed every six months or so when you have a large uh, number and a, and a person in a lab can do them all at once. You have to do them right away. Uh, and so there's expense, there's time, there's issues of standardization that take it away from exploratory studies that we do in, in various um, uh, settings to something that's used to uh, in a clinical trial or standard of care. Things have to be standardized by certain uh, tests such as uh, there's CLIA tests and so on that, that that go beyond a research laboratory into a, into a sort of standard practice laboratory. So there's that aspect to it. Um, and you know that's an important one. And then of course the, the biggest challenge is to identify what predictive markers and risk markers may, may exist. And that requires a lot of study. It requires large cohorts of people that you followed um, to do this. It, it requires a lot of collaboration across different cohorts and different countries and, and uh, clinical and basic and so on. You're on the steering committee of the AACR and NCI Clinical and Translational Research Committee. Would you describe the increased need for collaboration between basic, clinical, and translational and also prevention researchers? Yeah, it's extremely important because, um, again, to achieve the goal of personalized prevention, again, or, or therapy, there has to be a very tight uh, collaboration between clinical uh, and basic researchers um, to be able to um, move 
promising results um, from, from the laboratory to the clinic and back again to study. It's particularly important in the area of targeted um, uh, development of, uh, of agents, molecular targeted agents. Um, one needs to be able to go back and forth to understand mechanisms in the laboratory to, uh, to assess what we would look at clinically. Um, and so it's, it's very important. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's important to, to have this close collaboration, not only uh, locally, but internationally. Uh, we need to pool all of our resources to move uh, quickly. It's very clear that um, you know, cancer is a, is, a, is a growing problem, and we need to, um, uh, we need to work as a, very closely together to try to, to, try to treat this. And the, the problem, the double-edged sword of, these, uh, of what we're doing with personalized prevention is that we're identifying certain subgroups. So we're not treating all, pe all smokers or all people with a certain cancer with the same thing. We're s subsecting individuals into, into different groups. So what was one disease before is, in fact, um, a, a number of subsets of disease that respond differently. Um, and we have to identify those, and we have to you know, pool resources and work together, again, across uh, different regions and, and countries to try to move this quickly so we can make an impact. Um, uh, in preventing uh, this disease on, in a timely way. The impact factor of cancer prevention research has increased tremendously under your leadership. What are some of the innovative aspects you've brought to cancer prevention research, and how do you differentiate this journal from others? Well, the major goal of this journal is, is a translational one. So we really tried to accomplish what I just said, and that is to, to have a venue or a vehicle to link um, basic researchers interested in carcinogenesis and prevention to clinical researchers um, doing interventions of various, of various types. Um, we tend to be very siloed in medicine because um, we're busy and you focus on your certain area which may be working in mouse models or large clinical trials, but it's clear there has to be more um, uh, interface. And so what we've done is had a mix of these types of articles and what we've done that's um, that's innovative is we've taken um, uh, various articles um, uh, that, that illustrate this and we've had what we call perspectives where um, experts in the field will put this work into the context of, um, of the field. So it's different than editorial which might talk about the pros and cons of a certain article and, 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 and delve into details. This will put this work into the context of, of work in this area from basic to clinical work so that um, someone who's working in um, large clinical trials, for instance, who wouldn't normally read the kind of journals that would have important preclinical work in carcinogenesis and prevention, uh, can pick up the journal and read uh, an area that they may not know as much about and then a perspective that puts it in context. So they start to understand the importance and, and, and the hope is that this will lead to collaborations and a closer integration of, of different fields that are, um, that are all working on prevention and it's very clear that we can't do it alone. We need, to, we need to break down these silos. We need to work closer together. And, and I don't think there's any reason that that's not happening as much. I think it's just everyone's busy and it's hard to focus on your, your certain areas. So the, the journal, we like to think, is, is one um, small step towards that, um, that, that people actually can pick up something, read a perspective about an article they normally would never read um, because they don't, maybe they're not working in the field, and, and say, geez, that's relevant to me and to to the people that I'm uh, treating, uh, or this is an interesting question, I can go back to a mouse model and figure out how it works so I can and talk with this clinical uh, group to integrate it into the clinic. So it's that real uh, um, uh, role and, and uh, you know, as, uh, and I, I think it's, you know, I think it's achieving some success at bringing uh, different, different groups together that all have the common goal and theme to um, make an important impact and prevent cancer in people. Dr. Lippman, thank you so much. Thank you very much.